Hey, as a heads up, this video contains spoilers for Glass Onion and Barbarian. And also The Sixth Sense, Scream, Psycho, When Harry Met Sally, and Star Wars Episode Four. So if you don't want to get spoiled, just don't watch this video. Cool? All right. Okay, so in screenplay structure, there's this thing called the midpoint. It's halfway through the movie and is traditionally when new information is brought to light that ratchets up tension, raises the stakes, or otherwise spins the story forward in a new direction. If you're not quite sure about it, think about in Star Wars A New Hope when Luke, Leia, Han, the whole crew discover the Death Star for the first time, see it with their own eyes. That changes their perspective. It shows them what they're up against and really drives home the fact that they have a huge task to accomplish. Or in my favorite genre romantic comedies, in When Harry Met Sally, at the midpoint is when Harry and Sally sleep together for the first time. This takes their previously uncomplicated, amiable friendship and adds a bunch of complexity and tough questions and feelings into it and spins their relationship forward into something that it wasn't previously. The midpoint is a key moment that helps catapult our characters to their final confrontation with their enemy or, in the case of When Harry Met Sally, their inevitable confrontation with themselves about what it means to be in love and to not be afraid of those feelings. And also it's the catalyst for the internal change that needs to come from the characters in order for them to accomplish their goal. Think Luke finally closing his eyes and trusting the Force over what he can see. That's what the midpoint does. It forces the characters to come to a reckoning with all the things inside them and around them that they need to change in order to achieve what they need to achieve. But with a couple movies recently, I've noticed the midpoint is doing something different, something new. It not only spins the story forward in a new direction, but makes you, the audience, look backward at the front half of the story. It recontextualizes everything you've seen up to that point and forces you to look at the beginning of your story, of the movie, with new eyes. It's more than just a twist. Because, like, at the end of The Sixth Sense, when Bruce Willis, so it's revealed that he's been a ghost the whole time, all you have to do is walk out of the theater and bask in that knowledge and remember, oh yeah, that totally makes sense. This midpoint is more than a twist. It takes the idea of a twist and then forces the characters, the audience, the filmmaker, whoever, to deal with it throughout the next half of the film. It forces you to reconcile that back half of the film, the first part, that means something completely different now that you've seen the midpoint, with the end that also has to match with the beginning and the... It's, it's a whole thing. It's a new kind of midpoint. The two movies, if you couldn't tell from my disclaimer at the beginning, are Glass Onion and Barbarian. And because of them, I'm wondering if this new midpoint is going to become a thing. So first, Glass Onion. The beginning part of Glass Onion, we have all of these rich people solving a puzzle and then coming to the island and trying to solve Miles' murder mystery murder. And then we have Dave Bautista's character, Duke, dying from pineapple juice. Duke, don't answer pineapple. And then Andy gets shot and Benoit Blanc cares a lot. Like he cares more than he should care if he's never met her before. That is when things get interesting because then at that midpoint when Andy gets shot, we go back in time to when at the beginning Benoit Blanc was in the bath playing Among Us with Angela Lansbury and Stephen Sondheim and Karima Abdul-Jabbar on Zoom, very classic beginning of the COVID pandemic, and his partner, Hugh Grant, well, he's not married to Hugh Grant, but like the actor Hugh Grant plays his partner, answers the door, and Benoit Blanc has a visitor. And we kind of heard about that earlier, but we were just distracted by like all of the Angela Lansbury, Stephen Sondheim, Kareem Majul Jabbar of it all. And we see who the visitor was. The visitor was Andy, except it's not Andy. It's her twin sister, Helen, because Andy has been murdered and she's been dead the whole time. And Helen and Benoit Blanc work out a thing because Helen just wanted Benoit Blanc to go to this party and figure out who killed her sister because all of the people at this party on Miles Bronze Island are suspects. Helen wanted that, but Benoit Blanc said, no, I need your help. You come, you pretend to be Andy. We can figure it out together. And that's when we realize that this whole story up to now isn't who's trying to kill Miles. It's not who killed Duke, no. This entire time, we've been watching Helen investigate her sister Andy's murder. And everyone on the island is a suspect. And more than that, somebody the entire time has been playing it real cool or not 
because we don't know, we hadn't been looking for it, because they know that Andy's dead, because no one had released the information beforehand. They can't let it, anybody know, because then they'll out themselves as the murderer. Going forward, because I, get, I don't need a spoiler alert, because I already gave you a spoiler alert at the beginning of the video, but spoiler alert anyway, as a formality, Helen's not dead. She's able to continue investigating and really find the answer to who killed her sister. But now, as the audience, we're sitting there thinking, wait, what did I miss? What clues did I miss? How could I solve this murder? I didn't even know that that was the murder we were being, we were solving. It's just a whole, well. A donut hole in a donut's hole. And next, we have Barbarian. So the beginning of Barbarian starts out like a pretty typical contained horror at an Airbnb where Tess and Keith double book the place. And Keith, who I'm just going to call Pennywise because he's played by Bill Skarsgård, who played Pennywise in It, the Carrie Fukunaga one. The movie's playing on our expectation that he is going to be a killer because he played a horror icon. Do I look like some kind of monster? So we're watching Tess and Pennywise have their like little drinks and like is he creepy? Is he not? What's going on? And this Airbnb, we discover, has a murder basement. And Tess finds this out and she is like, yo, Pennywise, we gotta go. And Pennywise is like, no, it's cool because men are dumb and will apparently ignore the fact that there is a murder basement. There is a blood smear on the wall. There is a like rickety old metal bed that looks like something out of a prison and a mattress that looks like something I had at camp when I was 12 years old. And there's a bucket and there's a whole other door to a basement that you can't even see the bottom of. Like, everything is just run, nope, don't. And Pennywise is like, mm, let me see what's down there. Like, why? Why, 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 why? It's terrible. And then dumb, love-struck Tess, when he doesn't come back, follows him down. And at that point, I'm like, oh, Pennywise is gonna kill her. He is just luring her down into this murder basement to kill her, but he does not. Instead, he gets hit over the head and killed, and suddenly, we are driving down PCH with Justin Long in a convertible. <sighs> we haven't seen Justin Long at this point in the movie before. We don't even know, like, it's just been Pennywise and Tess, and like, the person who Tess did her job interview with. That's it. And also, they were in Detroit, and Justin Long's on PCH in LA. And at the, that's the midpoint. Justin Long driving down the highway. And at this point, I saw the movie in a theater, and someone behind me just yelled, What the fuck are we watching? To which I say, Good question, because I had no idea either. We had just left our final girl, who we assumed was our final girl, Tess hanging. We think that Pennywise got murdered, and then we think that obviously, like, Tess probably got murdered too. Like, what happened to her? Why are we spending time with Justin Long? Because, by the way, his character is a terrible person. We we meet him while he's all happy, and then we find he gets a call because there are accusations that he raped a co-star on his TV show, and we later find out that that was 100% true. He doesn't believe it was because he's a terrible human being, but there was no consent, and she said stop. So we're left hanging with where Tess is, and then we're dealing with Justin Long right now, and the recontextualization isn't, oh, clearly Justin Long killed Tess. No, it's who are we rooting for? The recontextualization isn't the same as in Glass Onion. The recontextualization isn't, oh, I didn't realize I was watching that beforehand, and now it's something else. No, the question is, why did we watch it? Who are we rooting for? What is happening? Because this whole scenario plays with our sense of what a slasher film, of what a horror film means. Tess was supposed to be our final girl, and halfway through the film, she's done so. Like, obviously, Marion Crane in Psycho died pretty early on in the film. We get a lot more time without her than we do with her. And in Scream, even, Drew Barrymore, we see her immediately think, oh, okay, final girl, cool, and she gets killed before the title even rolls. So we have a sense, like, oh, in horror movies, sometimes our first final girl isn't our first final girl, but now we have a rapist. Who are we rooting for here? What is he do even doing in this film. And why do we watch everything with Tess and Pennywise? Barbarian takes our expectations and not only twists them, but just throws them in the garbage can. And suddenly the tension is ratcheted up because we're wondering about what happened in the beginning. Did it even matter? How does it connect to what's happening in the second half? It's making us try to find something to hold on to as we're going forward with Justin Long because you don't want to root for him. He's an awful person. And that creates a sense of unease. 
because we're trying to recontextualize everything we've seen back then with what's happening now. Like, maybe is this a prologue? Is Justin Long setting up the murder basement? And then we discover he's not. Everything is up in the air and it, there's an extra sense of tension because why do we watch that seemingly unimportant prologue slash first half of the movie? But then the stories converge. We realize that Tess is alive and Justin Long is almost more of a villain in a way than this mama monster person who she's been trying to escape from. It's so satisfying. And the stories converge in Glass Onion as well because the beginning of the story of Miles Braun as a mad genius versus what we see at the midpoint, which is that he's hosting a murder mystery party and there are a bunch of murder suspects here. Those stories converge because Helen solves the real whodunit and then crushes Miles' dreams in the same way that he crushed Andy's by blowing them all up. Except Miles did it in a figurative sense and Helen did it in a literal sense, but hey. <laughs> Convergence is convergence. It's such a cool device to use the midpoint to spin the story forward in a new direction while simultaneously making an audience look backwards at the beginning of the film and think about that part of the film in a new way. It also adds rewatchability to the film just naturally because at the midpoint when everything changes, including your perception of what happened beforehand, it makes you want to go back and re-watch the first part of the film with new eyes, not only knowing what the ending is, but knowing what's going to happen in the middle and how can you find ways to reconcile that first half with that second half when there's a giant twist reveal perspective change that happens within that midpoint. Plus, side note, when I was an exec, I was looking for rewatchability all the time because rewatchability means that people are going to watch a film more, which means that it gets popular, which means it's going to get talked about, which means it's going to make more money, and everyone who watches it is probably going to watch it a second time. It's a great trait to have in your script, and because of these factors, I'm wondering, is this new pinpoint going to catch on? Is this the beginning of a pattern? I think it should be because it's not something that needs a ton of money to be done right. All you need is a creative writer who can figure out ways to surprise the audience and themselves, whether it's Glass Onion style, where in the middle the writer goes, okay, by the way, the story you've been watching, it's been interesting, but really it's a whole different story than you actually thought it was or barbarian style where it's let's subvert this genre to the point that you don't know what's going to happen and you're adding tension from your own expectations just like playing with the film knowledge of an audience but neither of those take a lot of money all it takes is creativity it's not like we're saying everyone needs to add a burning building sequence no think about how the film is structured so that you can take maximum advantage of things that audience expects and the audience is going to want to know and how you present that information. Writing is like a puzzle so often and this is like finding new ways to insert the same old pieces. And I'm telling you all this because I got some notes from my writing group on my contained romantic comedy feature script. This is a script that is, um, is too long and I'm trying to find ways to make it tighter and more focused, more engaging and just overall better. And one of the things I asked my writing group to take a look at when they were reading is where they got bored and where they got re-engaged. And unanimously, all of them got re-engaged at the end of act two, the break into act three moment, where a character thought that a task that had been given to him, it was revealed that the task wasn't just something that was given to him, but it was designed for him. And that made him feel a type of way. And that moment where the tenor of the task changed is something that they all sat up and paid attention to. And then we started talking about Glass Onion and Barbarian and how you can shift the expectations of the audience in new ways. And I kind of just put two and two together. And so I am going to take this break into act two moment. I'm going to move it to the midpoint. I'm going to really center my script around this task in a structural sense, because it's still a romantic comedy that's still going to be about the relationship, but this task is going to be at the heart of it. And I'm going to use this new midpoint to find a way to help the audience recontextualize everything they've seen about this task up until that point, and then watch as the story unfolds with this new information and also how it affects the relationship and how it affects the person, the character who it was revealed to. 
I'm really excited to try this new midpoint and put it into action and hopefully continue this pattern, continue this new form of structure, this new innovation on structure with my film. So I said that there's only two movies that's done this, but those are the only two movies I've seen. So if you're watching this and you think you have an idea of another movie that's done this new midpoint thing, drop it in the comments. Or if you think I'm full of shit, drop that in the comments too. I'm always interested in a good discussion about films. And this is also why I love watching new films because it inspires me and gives me new ideas and techniques to try and experiment with. Now that I've gotten all of that off my chest, it's time for me to actually go back and rewrite. So thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you next week for more of Cake Fight Presents The Making Of.